The next episode then uh, was Smite from Above. This was the execution of the planning that you had done in the last session and and all of that. And this was maybe a, th a throw to my time as a Shadowrun GM. It was very shallow. <laughs> right. An aerial insertion. A, a, a high intelligence wizard with access to, to, to various spells seems like a viable attack. And that is what this one was. You guys teleport 200 feet above, above a demon infested lair where, where it is suspected that this, uh, this wizard is operating. And oh boy, it's fun from there. <laughs> the advantages and disadvantages were pretty uh, impactful that fight yeah yeah the, the protection from evil dash fiends what, between that and the magic circle there was the fight could have gone a lot differently if if some of that hadn't gotten off and that was the intent was, was she was going to heavily weight the battle on this end because not for nothing, she knows that that was the first fight, not the last fight. So she wanted to make sure you guys didn't die in the first one. Because otherwise, then she has to go report a failure to the tower again. And that never goes well. <laughs> but the fight itself was a lot, a lot of time. Right? It, it, it was D&D, &D, but out of, out of the normal element. Like, and again, like, hey, I, I love as a GM to create an environment that is also part of the fight. In this case, falling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the air level. <laughs> Better than the water level. Right. <laughs> I definitely preferred the falling to the getting wet. Yeah. The shorter level. Well, and it turns out that uh, Click Clack had been holding on since day one of his of his character creation to <laughs> to an item. I think was it was because I mentioned the pair, or was it because I mentioned the airships? Is that why you had it? I don't remember what the original inspiration was. It just seemed like something he would have. <laughs> he he's aware there's a lot of. Places that are much farther down than other places, and so he built an insurance policy. Right. Well, and gnomes, gnomes culturally were the inventors of airships, and very common, common in gnomish lands to have to travel somewhere by air. It, in in my head, it was just him w when he was getting ready to venture out. He's aware that there's cliffs. <laughs> And that's your plan A, is parachute down the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely, like, that cemented the, the crazy prepared trope being applied to Click Clack. Like, like, at that point, you know, like, ah, oh, shit's going down. I'll just pull out my parachute. You're what? <laughs> Yet, yeah, I have other objects, too. I have other inventions, yeah. Like, I have a whole section of my sheet that has not been touched since day one. But it's stuff that he just has on him in case shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that you, that you haven't, as a player, you haven't felt the need to, like, shoehorn that in every time. Because uh, then when it does come up, it turns out it's like, What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's only entertaining to me if it happens organically, and uh, then I then I have the gizmo. If I'm right. just like, let's go jump off this cliff, that's less entertaining. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So you guys land, uh, create a holy ruckus, and. Strana summons David Bowie. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. As Ziggy Stardust. Oh, as though uh, 
as the long queue. We were just to the point where you summoned Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> I think that was a good, uh, good, good moment of creativity there. Right, right, and also very much the right spell at the right time. Radiant damage uh, at that point in the fight just crushed it. That's a, that's a clever spell, and I, I like the. I like having to adjust spells for bard influence. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you cherry pick off another list. I really liked the teamwork combo uh, that, that came up on it. Like, be, because of the way the battlefield was set, stands turning, just, just like, everything got, got just romped on attacks of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and and it wasn't even reactions from that from David Bowie, but just like everything that goes past him is like, and I grant you some radiant damage, and you get some radiant damage. <laughs> yeah, that that whole combat visually was very interesting. Again, three dimensional combat. It ended up with you know the parachuting down on a on a firing platform, fighting demons in the air. Good times were had by all. So then you land, you uh, you fight off the rest of them. Struana is sent with a scroll to go inspect the statues at the front, uh, while Sangrid is digging through the well of blood uh, in its demon lair, and, and and you know uncovering scroll uh, scribed runes on there and she tells you that that she knows what this is this is a portal and she knows that there could only be one renegade that this could be now and that is where i cliffhangered you uh last time yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is where I'm cliffhangering you again because that's that's the end of our game diaries wrap up. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I, man, I am straight up fascinated by those statues. Like I'm, I my brain is certain of things that I don't want to give you any ideas for because you've already got ideas. You already have a plan. I'm not going to add to your plan. I just have that like, oh, I bet. <laughs> It's like, it's like watching a movie and you're like, oh, this trope, that, that thing's happening, it's going to happen this way, and this is the, oh, look, it happened how I said. Right, and I am not ashamed to use tropes at all. Like, I, they, they are important storytelling elements. It's when you tell it, use a trope badly that it becomes a cliche. Yeah, there's a reason they're tropes. Right, right, Shakespeare used tropes. Every, <laughs> every movie is a hero's journey. Oh, yeah. Every yeah. movie, like, oh, wow. and I knew those beats already. Now I'm literally studying that stuff in college, and yep. so every movie, it's just. I mean, like, Rubber, Strange Circus, like. <laughs> there are a few I would disagree with you on, but they're like weird esoteric horror bullshit. So right, I'm, well, I'm clearly generalizing. Okay. Sure. Right, and there are there are those that that intentionally attempt not to be, and even then, sometimes they are. Well, yeah, like, the, like Kubo and the Two Strings. I Kubo love that. Oh my god! Beautiful, gorgeous piece of art, but the I whole to, time, oh and like, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then it looks beautiful. The art design is amazing. But beat for beat, yep. ah. it's absolutely yeah. hero's journey. But where it does really well is some of the surprising turns it takes, and how it doesn't lean on some other tropes that tend to be associated with hero's journey, and still tells a story of like, like familial warmth. Like, how often does that happen? It's like Fievel, uh any of the Fievel stories, how often do you have, like, characters who have good sibling relationships? Yeah. Like, so, uh, anyway, well, I, I really liked it. I, I loved Kubo. I loved it. 
but story wise, mm -hmm. it was amazing to be like artistically stimulated and narratively bored. <laughs> I, I honestly, I want to own it. To it's a story I want to own to show to someday children. Yes, that's how I feel about it. And that narrative formula, because that's exactly what it is. That, that's that that was that wasn't Joseph Campbell deciding that that's how it should be. That was him noticing that every story right. that had been told before him had it was, it might, many, many it was identifying a pattern. Right? But then once he identified it, people started to use it as a blueprint. So now it's a self-reinforcing self loop. <laughs> you ever see the movie Aragon? Yes. The kid with the dragon egg? Uh-huh. I didn't ever know... Just, just beat for fucking beat. Like, Jeremy Irons shows up, and I'm like, oh, I love you, and you're gonna die. <laughs> you're the wise old master, and your clock is ticking. And, and like, a scene later, he got, yeah. like, five minutes of screen time. They got Jeremy Irons to be their Obi-Wan, and they kill him in five minutes. Wow. Wow. Well, there there was a lot with that movie that could have done, been done. That. Yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, uh, we will probably wrap up here. Um, we'll we'll take our game diary sessions to an end and begin the the the, the part where we chop it up and post it. <laughs> and uh, if you uh, thanks everyone for watching Game Breakers. If you like what we do. Hit the like button. If you want to see more of it, hit the subscribe button. And if you think we could do it better, uh, hop over to our Patreon. Pitch, up a, pitch us a couple of bucks for things like graphic and music and an editor. <laughs> Meanwhile, have a good game.